Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Fantastic. How's it going? Good. Very nice to see you again. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah. I think we'll just wait a few minutes to see everybody's kind of joining in, uh, giving them a little bit of time. That'd be really nice. Sure. It looks like you're almost outside. I think there's some sunshine or something. It looks really yeah. nice. It's been kind of like rainy and then sunny and then windy all day today. So, but I think you might be just getting a nice ray of sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> I think a week ago in Austria we had snow and then today it was almost 20 degrees. It's been really, yeah, roller coaster. Um, Apocalyptic. Yeah, but it's climate change, you know. <laughs> Suitably. Yes. Yeah. That's what I thought. I was like, <laughs> people in, in shorts and dresses and I was like I was hyped oh. snow we, yeah <gasps> very suitable. crazy yeah <laughs> and are you staying in Austria because I've heard you you said you were leaving soon yeah I'm, I mean I'm staying I just moved here in summer last July um, but I'm keeping my apartment and um, I quite like it as a base okay. I've never been here before yeah. but um, once I moved it's quite a nice mix of somehow Germany and Italy in the south. Like, I'm Ooh, sounds very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've never been to Vienna or Austria. I'd yeah, really like to go. Until 10 months ago. So, um, one of the places. Um, yeah, once again, thank you so much for joining everybody. Um, I think we'll take this another minute, but I'm really happy to see so many um, of you are here already. Um, I'm really, really happy about this talk. I'm really glad Helen is joining me today. So um, thanks for everybody else who's, who's tuning in. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It's so nice to have the invitation. It's so incredible how this is possible. I think that's one of my favorite things about um, the current state of crisis, how, how much it sort of inspired this international collaboration without any trouble necessary. Yeah. Um, no, it's really true. I've definitely spoken to so many people I would never have spoken yeah. to if it hadn't have been for this lockdown. So something to be grateful for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Connects yet separates all of us. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, quite nice. Um, maybe we're going to go ahead. Anybody who hasn't joined until now, of course, we'll sort of recap in between. But also we always upload our, the videos on our Instagram. So if you're missing today... Um, that's not a problem at all. And also, of course, you can always text us directly with questions um, during this conversation, but also later. I think we're all happy to, to sort of revisit themes. But for now, I'm extremely happy to have Helen Turner with me today. Um, she's the artistic <laughs> co-director of Ebeck Luckenwalde, which is just about 50 kilometers south of Berlin. Um, so it's a relatively new um, institution, and it's actually, I want to say, the only art institution um, worldwide that's 100% sustainable. So I think this is um, incredible to have you today. I'm so excited to hear about it. Um, you and Pablo Vendor's work, which is your artistic curator, uh, curator, so I'm really, really happy that you're joining me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Right in. Um, I would love to hear sort of what led you to starting this project, um, sort of how, how did you decide on the geography, how did you come up with this um, framework? Yeah, well, <clears throat> so Pablo, who's also my partner, um, he's been working with electricity as a medium for the last 10 years, and that was kind of actually born out of financial precarity as an artist. He found himself in this position where he was being invited to do exhibitions worldwide and sort of it, quite successful, but not actually being able to afford his utility bill because he wasn't being paid adequately for these opportunities. And as a kind of performative, conceptually based artist, his practice wasn't commercial. And so he found himself in this position where he wasn't able to pay his electricity bill. And he thought, well, you know, God, what is, what is this about? Yeah. And so he said, okay, I'm just going to start producing my own electricity. And so, I mean, Pablo's this, I hope you meet him one day because he's this he's the biggest creative problem solver I've ever met he's kind of this amazingly resourceful person and so he figured out a way to produce his own electricity through his own electricity socket in his house and then this kind of snowballed and he started seeing this kind of huge potential in the artistic capacity of electricity and that's when he decided to start working with it as an artistic medium 
Um, and then he started producing sculptures and installations and interventions where he would, these would generate their own electricity. And then, then that kind of snowballed as well. And then he actually developed his own electricity provider called Performance Electrics. And he set that up as a not-for-profit. So we're the only not-for-profit electricity provider in the whole of Germany. Um, and then he would sort of generate electricity through these artworks feed it into the national grid, and then he would have this client network throughout Germany who would actually fund his artistic practice. So essentially anyone could switch to performance electrics like you would switch to, you know, uh, BP or E.ON or, you know, any kind of major electricity provider. But rather than funding them, you would be funding an artist's practice. And as a not-for-profit, 100% of the revenue would then go straight into the development of green electricity and also contemporary art. So this happened, so he set this up in 2012 and that sort of, he was doing quite well. And then he was sort of expanding and he had this client network of 25 museums and Kunstvereins and institutions throughout Germany. And he wanted, and then he had this crazy idea to transform a fossil fuel power station into a contemporary Kunstrom craft work. So Kunstrom is the kind of art power that directly translates as art power. And that's the energy that Pablo produces. So then he starts. Looks like so. I'm just going to put oh. the image there. Um, that, yes. Yeah. Readily available. So these are actually um, the gas tanks that are outside of Eva, and this is a project called Superconstrum that Pablo did last year. And so they're kind of your generic 1980s typical uh, petrol station yeah. that he actually changed all the inner workings of it. So rather than providing petrol, they actually provide electricity. So they're outside e and now you can come with your e-bike or your electric car and you can power your car or your bike for free. So this was, this was a kind of another mission of Pablo's is the kind of decentralization, democratization of electricity and kind of, and, you know, I mean, he's really kind of raising awareness of like the need for kind of more sustainable practices yeah. in culture, but also systemically. Um, so then he was looking for this power station and uh, couldn't find anywhere in Stuttgart. That's where he's based because it's an extremely wealthy area and he didn't have a huge budget. And somebody said, why don't you have a look in Brandenburg? You know, it's for former East Germany and specifically in Luckenwalder, which is this post-industrial city. And there was this abundance of abandoned listed buildings. So for instance, around the corner, we have um, an Eric Mendelssohn hat factory that was built in 1928. And it's world famous abandoned I might add as well so if anybody's in the market <laughs> it's a phenomenal building <laughs> yeah. um, and then next door there is the Bauhaus city pool which was built in 1928 and designed by Hans Hertline which is really spectacular so he looked at this first someone said oh why don't you have a look at the sw sw swimming pool and he did and then he saw the power station yeah. and obviously that was just perfect and <clears throat> it wasn't on the market uh, he managed to track down the landlord, basically, and then went into a year and a half of negotiation to try and convince him to put it on the market for one and to give it to Pablo for a peppercorn rate. Yeah. And so, and he did. <laughs> He's very compelling, also Pablo. <laughs> um, so then he took the building on in 2017. And then uh, I was based in London as a curator. I was working at Cass Culture Foundation at the time. And he said, you know, why don't you just come and have a look at this building? I think you might be interested to <laughs> do something with me. And I did. Um, and I was just completely astounded. I mean, architecturally, it's a total jewel. I mean, hopefully all of our watchers will be able to visit us one day and you will be able to visit us. But um, yeah, so this is the outside area. This is the sort of reverse of the power station. But the front door has this incredible stained glass window, yeah. which you may have. An, here we are. Yeah. yeah. So this is like this stained glass and it's this fist purporting lightning bolts. And it's a kind of real illustration of what the rest of the building is like, because it was built in 1913. And that was sort of 20, 30 years after the genesis of electricity. So they were really trying to convince people of electricity's kind of power and necessity um, municipally. So rather than industrial, as most power stations, which a lot of other contemporary art institutions are based in, it's really municipal. So we have a 360 meter square turbine hall, which is basically like a ballroom. Yeah. It's, you know, so it's this kind of incredible architectural building. And when I visited Pablo, I just had this huge sensation of potential with this building. And just, you know, of course I jumped basically. Yeah. 
quit my job and moved to Germany. I thought I was moving to Berlin, <laughs> but I suddenly realized <laughs> I was moving to yeah. Brandenburg. <laughs> but I mean, I was based in London and, you know, to get anywhere in London takes about an hour. So to go 30 minutes out of the city was kind of just like going somewhere in Hackney for me. So it didn't, you know, it was, it seemed really feasible. So then I moved in and then we spent um, from 2018 to 2019 basically reactivating the power station. So Pablo worked with a lot of the men who used to work at the power station when it was a brown coal power station to understand how all the mechanics operated. Yeah. And miraculously, he managed to reactivate all this machinery, which is original from 1913. So the, you can see this is the engine room. Um, and it, he calls it the dinosaur, and it does have this kind of like prehistoric <laughs> museum feeling to it, even all the sounds. And, and the moment that he managed to get the huge gearbox gearbox in the engine room working again it sort of groaned into action and it you know it was chilling really you did feel like you were back in time you know experiencing this moment of history so he reactivated this mechanical conveyor belt which used to transport the brown coal which you can see at the top here yeah. um, where these cogs are and so now he transports uh, waste locally sourced wood chips from the Brandenburg forests through the conveyor belt and then down into these huge bunkers. And then, and then that shifts through the system into the basement where we have a wood gas system. And that then generates uh, electricity for the power station, so the building that we live in, but then also feeds into the national grid and is provided to our clients throughout Germany. And then all the profit from those electricity sales goes straight back into the contemporary art program, which I curate. So this is- Just in a nutshell, just that's in a what nutshell. we did. <laughs> so it's it's quite interesting because there's this duality where the whole building is almost this living sculpture that produces electricity that then feeds back into other people's practice. So it's almost, you know, an installation by him and by himself, but also yeah. this very real component where people can just, use of electricity and it's just at the end of the day you know providing something for the community and well for yeah. Germany which is quite incredible how it's a functioning you know thing that also happens yeah. to be in our installation and the space um, yeah absolutely I mean I think that was we talk about the um, institution as a functional sculpture yeah so this kind of living breathing artwork that is constantly being worked on basically and extended and adapted um, and I think that's something Pablo and I are really kind of interested and committed to kind of like how art can operate socially and politically, you know, how it has this function. Um, and I think uh, Harry Thorne, who's a um, journalist, wrote an article about us for Freeze, and he said that what we were doing is the, what the best art does is serves a public and serves a purpose. Yeah. And I just felt that kind of summed up what we were trying to do as well, you know, kind of, you know, serve our public with electricity, but then also serving this purpose to kind of ameliorate sustainability practices within the arts as well. And it really much touches also upon the, the possibilities that happen once you have a, an artist with an active art practice participate in the institutional framework itself and how that creates this momentum where so often there's sort of this disconnect between, you know, making sure that the artist absolutely can can live out sort of the idea of he had of the work and the institution mm -hmm. is this constant back and forth because it's so hard to sort of balance it out sometimes and it's quite interesting when you think about institutions being run or being organized by artists or outside of or coming out of an art project because it you know that sort of came first in this case so it's quite interesting and in yeah you've continued that in a sense that you invite artists also as consultants in a sense um, yeah so um I mean I think Pablo's worked his practice as an artist is really based in kind of urban development in a way he's kind of always working with city planners politicians um so he's he's always been quite keen that it's not just a contemporary art audience that we're addressing it's kind of like every man and when we're when we came here as well we were so um determined to involve the local community as well and not just kind of create this contemporary art island in the middle of Brandenburg you know and so that's why we keep the institution free and we really make an effort to kind of bring people in and that I think that was one of the reasons as well Pablo wanted to reach out to all the men that worked here you know I mean women also worked here but 
unfortunately in the 50s and 60s it was the men who worked in the in the engine room so um but no i mean they're they're equally as important as the kind of you know art elite as well so we just kind of trying to de democratize our audience as well um but yeah and i think i mean i guess that's kind of in the same vein as you know someone like theasta gates who is kind of working in his practice as kind of like urban development as a kind of material as well and I think that's, you know, something that Pablo is really keen to do. And then, yeah, so last summer we did a, um, a podcast series. Well, it was actually a video series called The Artist's Consultant. And that was sort of positioning artists in this leading role and asking them to consult on how to improve the world. And that was really born out of um, the, the lockdown, I guess, yeah. the pandemic. And just we we sort of at the precipice of the pandemic we thought do we go digital do we translate all our program that we have planned into a digital realm or do we take a moment and think about what's going on as a new institution and trying to you know trying to think consciously about how to run this i guess that was also <laughs> born out of the fact that i'd also given birth the year before and had this roller coaster yeah. of a year and suddenly had this opportunity to just take a minute and think about everything so <clears throat> we didn't do much digitally and we just we just planned basically me and the team we have an amazing team of curators we just created a five-year plan program and then we also produced this uh, digital series called the artist consultant which was positioning artists in this kind of leading role and so we invited uh, Harold Offer and uh, Michelle Williams Gamaka for instance and they consulted on how to improve our education. And both as people of color, they were sort of talking about how, how whitewashed basically our education is and how, you know, there is so little voices for, of people of color in our education. And, you know, I was listening to them and I was so shocked and appalled at this system. And, you know, and they, they provided kind of counsel and advice on how to improve those practices. So that was one um, example. And then we also invited Pelish Empire and they were in discussion with Anna Gritz from, who's the chief curator at Kunstwerk in Berlin. Yeah. And they were consulting on parenthood in the arts and how, how, we can improve, how institutions can basically help those artists who are also parents to be able to continue their work. Yeah. Um, and you know, not basically to create these environments that don't impede on artistic integrity. Yeah. So that was our kind of, um, and that's a, I'm a very strong believer in that. I mean, I guess as a curator, I always say that artists are my best consultants. If I want advice, I always go to artists. And I think perhaps that is because, you know, of Pablo and I and our relationship and <laughs> how we're running this project. And I just think if you run a contemporary art institutions, institution, the people you should be talking to are the artists. How can we make this a better institution for them? You know, what are we doing wrong? You know, and they're also... The, them are the most brilliant minds, really. They're the best creative problem solvers. So Yeah, and it's quite brilliant because I think, particularly in mainland Europe, um, there's very little, or, or I feel like it's, it's a lot less dynamic, that whole conversation surrounding sort of um, bringing in a long-term engagement community, having sort of multiple voices in general, addressing this multiplicity of, you know, what an art institution can do and how important education programs are. And I found that quite... Um, is, I think, you know, to actually address that, which is often done outside of Europe, I think. But um, mm -hmm. it's really nice to see an institution really much feeding into that and, and, and rethinking that in, in the local context as well. Um, so I was, I was quite impressed by that, uh, to be honest. Um, <laughs> maybe oh, thank also you. on that note, um, I think it's almost like you're the, the EVAC is in flux in a sense. I looked a lot at the ecology statement that you have and how you even write out that sort of, you know, you, you are taking the stance already that you might have to, to change it as you go along, that you never have this idea of we set this up now and we know what's right and this is what we're going to stick to. Yeah. I have this sense that you're very much thinking about current events and what might change and how can we react to that and, and create a space that um, gives sort of uh, opportunities of depending yeah. on, on what's happening. I mean, I think we decided to write our ecology statement and I was nervous about it because I'm really allergic to kind of manifestos and any idea that knowledge or, you know, 
yeah, knowledge is fixed because it's constantly changing. And also, you know, who is to say that your knowledge is accurate? And I just felt like it had to be this constantly evolving adaptive document um, so that we wanted to write that into the kind of ecology statement that it would just be constantly changing with the times. And also, I think that echoes as well how Pablo and I feel about what we're doing sustainability wise with eVerk in that we're not experts. We don't, we're not saying that what we're doing is 100% um, good, you know, or 100% right or perfect. We're just, we're just trying. And I think that's really important for institutions and artists to do it and to, yeah. to fail as well. And I think, uh, I think that's what should be happening in kind of creative disciplines, kind of opening up this experiment to fail, like preparing yourself, but, to, but probably to succeed in certain aspects as well. So, um, yeah, that's a big kind of mission of ours as well. Yeah, I think it's quite beautiful to, to admit that because, of course, nobody knows, you know, particularly in moments of crisis, but in general, like if, if somebody claims to know it all or have on all the answers and where do you even go from there? So I think just to, to allow that and to say, you know, this is an interactive space. We don't know where it's leading, but um, we, we, we're trying. I think that's quite honest and quite beautiful in, in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, the art world has kind of been held to account this year and last year, you know, with the pandemic as well. And then you know, it was suddenly, I think it was the 2019 Venice Biennale, I think there was suddenly this kind of accountability towards the um, climate crisis, you know, and suddenly everyone was waking up and thinking, oh God, you know, the contemporary art world is so unsustainable. What are we going to do about it? And I, you know, and everyone, and what I found so refreshing about that is everyone was suddenly in this position of, I don't know, and holding their hands up and saying, you know, I don't know how to improve it, but okay, let's all get on the same level and try and work ourselves out of this situation. And I've just joined um, the Gallery Climate Coalition, which was set up by Thomas Dane Gallery in London, and they're uh, trying to establish a Berlin wing. Um, and it's so refreshing talking all to, to all these huge galleries who, you know, have this reputation, but well, they are extremely powerful and influential, but suddenly to be in a position where they're all saying, yeah, we don't know, like we're all in the same boat and it's kind of suddenly you're all in this on the same plane. And I think that's really great, actually, to, not, to de-hierarchize the system. Particularly, you know, the, the huge push that we have seen in the last few years or decades towards buying the system, towards culture tourism and this event um, mindset that comes with a biennial system in a sense um, and that's quite unsustainable on so many levels mm -hmm. from, from local populations to climate to, to traveling to city of everybody being everywhere at once um, and financially who can travel as much um, so I think maybe this is also a really good moment to, to talk about your upcoming program, which I'm extremely excited about. <laughs> you are planning to put on Sun and Sea, which was a Lithuanian pavilion in 2019. Um, so yes. I'm very, very happy um, that you're planning to have an addition um, of this fantastic work. Um, how yeah, us too. How did you to bring it? Um, well, after knowing the piece from Venice and seeing the impact it made on people, you know, people would literally leave the pavilion weeping. And it was just, it was obvious the kind of agency this work had and this kind of awakening it could have in people. And because of a kind of our underlying mission to kind of take action against the climate emergency, but also we need, you know, we're doing that but then we also need vehicles we also need contemporary art vehicles in order to talk about it and move people and like to create these kind of like agentic feelings in people so i just it was a dream to bring this work to evirk basically and then because we um have access to the swimming pool next door this bauhaus stadbad which we used for our opening in 2019 so we invited block universe who's a brilliant um contemporary art live contemporary art festival in london to curate Power Night and they brought Rowdy SS and he did this amazing immersive sound piece in the Stadtbad. And so I knew it was possible to use the space. And I knew that Lucia was taking it on a, Lucia Picciosti, who's the curator of Sun and Sea, was taking the piece on its world tour. Maybe, maybe I'm just backpackling a moment for people who yeah. didn't. Yeah, please, the please piece. do, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> no, I just wanted to jump in. I absolutely adored it so much. It was um, 
first premiered uh, in, in Lithuania, but then was brought over to the Venice um, Biennial. It was outside of Giardino Nazionale, which I think is quite crucial. It was in an abandoned space um, in Venice, close to the Arsenale, the um, um, ship factory, in, in a sense, within Venice. And it is this opera-based performance, which is very beautiful that it is, um, it went on literally all day, doing the, particularly in the opening and later um, a few times a week. And it's consisting of this very beautiful sort of romanticized beach scene where people just sort of leisurely spent, but then also are in this sort of state of uh, um, constant waiting because you, it's like the, the, the crisis is about to happen. So it has this incredible tension, yet it looks so idyllic and it very much plays into our fantasy of, of beach life. Yet, you know, the, the next wave could be the tsunami in, in that sense. So I think there's this very mm -hmm. tangible uh, um, catastrophe in, in, in the air, yet it's absolutely beautiful to watch gorgeous music. So it has these different layers. Um, maybe just as context, and then the, the audience was above it, which is also, I think, quite important that it felt very interactive, yet you have this distance. Um, sorry, just to, to jump in there. That's great. Thank you so much, Emily. That's lovely description, yeah. Um, so the, the kind of chillingness of the work, I knew I really wanted to bring it to Brandenburg, basically. And then, um, so I just reached out to Lucia. I didn't know her, and I just thought let's just see whether she might be interested to bring it to this small you know crazy new institution in Brandenburg and she was and she was you know thrilled and she knew about Everk and because Lucia Petriosti she's the general ecology curator at the Serpentine Galleries and so her real mission is to um, bring ecology into the kind of programming she does there she actually invented that role it didn't even exist she was invited to be a curator there and she said I'll do it but as long as I can be the ecology curator so um and then so we sort of worked to bring it here and then I was like oh we're looking for a guest curator for the next power night and Lucia you know you would be phenomenal to do this so I asked and she said yes to that as well so that was just amazing news and then we were meant to show it in September 2019, uh, 2020, excuse me. And then the pandemic hit, so we moved it to May. And then actually, just last week, we've decided to move it to June. But we're thrilled because now we'll be partnering up with Berliner Festspiele, Gropius Bau, to actually bring the work to Berlin and Brandenburg. And this it just makes so much sense for me because both ecolo ecologically and economically, you know, yeah. which basically stem from the same etymological word. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm really happy to like reduce the work's carbon footprint because it is a huge production that is, you know, yeah. touring the world and it's about the climate crisis. So I think it's really important to take account of how to do this work greenly. Yeah. Um, so in order to do that, so this is uh, Katerina Wolf and Chica Ares, who um, were both part of Block Universe 2019. And Katerina is actually now working for us as head of Power Night. Uh, and this is where the beach will go. So, um, yeah, there will be uh, 12 soloists in the beach and then 20 volunteers actually joining the beach and a dog. So we're looking for a dog <laughs> if anybody wants to bring theirs. Uh, and then the audience will be on the second level looking down into the beach. So I think... Um, it was one of the aspirations of the artists to show the work in an abandoned swimming pool. Um, yeah. So Lina Lippoletti was really, you know, thrilled that they would finally be able to show it in a pool. And this is the only pool on the tour. So we're really happy about that. And it will be the only presentation that is 100% green. And to do that, we're actually going to feed Kunstrom electricity that we generate here at Everk into the sw swimming pool. So it will be 100% powered by our electricity. And then we will also feed giant uh, water pipes into the pool. And then Pablo, ingenious Pablo, has developed a system where he will lay water pipes in the sand to provide actually underfloor heating for the performers. So, <laughs> so the performers will actually be heated by waste heat energy generated at Everk. So that's a really important issue for us, that it's all powered by Kunstrom generated here at Everk and it's all, it will be 100% CO2 neutral. It is incredible. It almost looks like it's meant to be because this color scheme works so well with the work too. When I first saw where you put it on, it was this sort of perfect. Yeah. <laughs> when thinking about it. Um, 
And I think what you were saying earlier, Emily, about this kind of sense of impeding catastrophe inherent to the work sun and sea. Lucia was saying how perfect it is in this pool because the abandoned swimming pool has this kind of ap apocalyptic feeling to it. Yeah. So I think this sense of catastrophe will be really enhanced here at the Stadtbad. Absolutely. I also, um, I think you touched upon it a little bit when I rudely jumped in there, um, that you, you really planned on, on the one hand, you work with volunteers and it's very much embedded in, in the local community in that sense, but also that you will um, fundraise because you are such, you know, a new institution that's very much coming out and, and that that's quite a large part of how, you, how you're going to put up um, the work as well. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's a phenomenally expensive work to produce. So um, there's, 20, there's a crew of 28 that you need to bring to Evoke, uh, to Luckenwalder, and then to bring the sand into the pool and then to power it with Kunstrom. It's, I'm not going to lie, I'm really happy to be transparent. It's expensive, yeah. but I really feel like it's really um, important to do this. Um, and, you know, also after this year of all these performance artists not being um, supported, having no work, I think it's really important to kickstart the program again and actually provide all these opportunities and give the cultural ecosystem a big boost so um yes so it's a really expensive work and as a new institution who is not publicly funded so um just to be really honest our income avenues are um constructs the generation of electricity which at the moment with 35 clients throughout germany is not huge and then we're project by project funded through Uh, funding applications essentially so me and the great team we have are constantly reaching out to new funding boards to get to ask for money basically and we've had a good year we've got a, a lot of good funding coming in but it's not enough and so this year we decided that we would launch a kickstarter to try and um, generate the cash and also I felt like it was a really good experiment to see how people would react because I think it's really important to, to acknowledge what everybody else wants to see. You know, as a curator, it's not just your mission and your vision being kind of like curated across the spaces. It's saying, okay, well, let's test to see how much people really want to see this piece here or yeah. not. <laughs> you know, like, do, do you want to see the, this work coming to Evoke? And if you do, then you have, you have a power to play in realizing this. And I'm not saying that everybody can donate, you know, thousands of euros. Of course they can't, I can't. But if you could donate one euro, five euros, that's just, you know, amazing. And we've been so humbled. We think we've had nearly 250 uh, supporters already. And I think that's amazing to see how many people really want to see the work here. So we're trying to raise 40,000 euros uh, by the 12th of April. And that is imperative to making the work happen. So if we don't raise that, then we, we won't be able to show the work. So it's, it's quite urgent, really. <laughs> But we're determined to make it happen. And, you know, we've got a lot of support from the, the Sun and Sea team. They're really trying to help us spread the word. So if anybody feels like donating, you can down like this. <laughs> I'm modeling here. <laughs> Say, yeah, we, I, I love sort of the, the scheme of how you set it up. This is actually you as Pablo, which is also nice to see his face. Um, <laughs> I'm not talking about him so much, but I think it's quite interesting how you really much, it's almost like a democratic tool too, in terms of sharing sort of the responsibility financially to put on something like this. But also then that, you know, you have, um, you, you did have sponsorship and you, you paired up and you get something in return. I think it was quite a, a thoughtful way to, to, to go about it as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so we've partnered up with um, Universal Works, who have just been really amazing. They're a British workwear company, and they have a real kind of um, mission to sort of support sustainable practices in, within fashion as well. So uh, they produce these amazing uh, rewards for us, which include the workwear jacket, which Pablo and I are wearing here, and the T-shirts Uh, and bandanas. So we really wanted to kind of offer rewards as well. So in exchange for your kind of generous, generous donation, you'd be able to receive a reward. Uh, yeah, I have to say my absolute favorite was actually this one where you can actually um, have an event with me, oh. which is so gorgeous. I was like, this is incredible. Um, I would absolutely do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all those cancelled weddings, you know, we have a venue for you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you can rent our space. Coming back a little bit maybe to, to the sense of that um, it's not your first performance art, but that your program very much is based on um, 
performance pieces. And you already talked a little bit about that in terms of that. Obviously, it was this moment you had to put that on hold um, <laughs> to, due to the crisis. But um, maybe also the immediacy. How, how did you, you know, decide that this is where you wanted to go with a, um, with a space, that this is sort of the main focus that you would want to have as an institution? Yeah, um, to be very honest, it wasn't that conscious. So it wasn't that I felt like, okay, we want to kind of really support all these performative practices. But I think it's just the the architecture of the space really invites it. Yeah. And because, because it is so kind of um, heavy, the kind of influence of the coal power, the fossil fuel, and then the new electricity, and the, all these kind of different ideas permeating the space, it's really exciting to kind of invite performance artists to deal with those narratives going on and to kind of create these like live commissions, like activations of the space. And I think for the opening program in 2019, you know, we had um, Power um, Block Universe invited Nina Bayer and she invited all the, the local wrestling club in Luckenwalde and they actually produced this wrestling match in the turbine hall and it was this kind of incidental activity so they would just kind of appeared from the crowd and started wrestling and that was such a good segue to get the local community involved as well and to kind of you know create access points as well I guess um, which was really important to me and then Nina also made all the wrestlers wear all these nine different 90s perfumes you know in her typical style it was you know, and all these kind of like CK1 perfumes were permeating the space. It was, it was really brilliant. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think it's just the architecture of the space just really invites that. I think there's also another kind of um, topic is architecture. So we have an architectural series called E-Pavilions where we invite artists to produce functional sculptures in the grounds here. So we have uh, over, over 10,000 meter squared site and so we can, you know, the garden area has really got so much potential as well. And for the opening, we invited Umschichten, who's an architectural collective in Stuttgart, to um, build this 18 metre diameter geodesic dome. Yeah. And that will be used for the public programme. And then last year, we invited Samuel Trindle um, to, to, to transform Trafo, which, is, which was where the electricity got transformed to low voltage to high voltage into an outdoor bar and kitchen. So, um, yes, so now we have these two functional sculptures in the grounds and we want to sort of continue that. So I think those are quite key concerns for Pablo and I is kind of architecture and performative practices. Yeah, and almost becomes this, it's on the intersection of community centre and art centre, but functioning power plant as we talked about before. So I think the layers that you're building within, you know, just the past two, three years is quite incredible and also really speaks for this long-term engagement with the community as we talked about you know there was such a push a few years ago towards all of a sudden it was all about community engagement but quite often on a very sort of um, short-term level but I think it's incredible how it's this ongoing constantly feeding into um, your programming. Um, yeah I mean I guess because Pablo and I live here as well so yeah. we're so aware of the community and and there's a real I don't know, I was, I was so ignorant about kind of former East Germany before I moved to, G to Germany and kind of the implications of that. And you really feel like there's a real downtrodden atmosphere in the city here and people don't, there's a sort of lack of self-belief yeah. or kind of lack of um, engagement with their, the value of their city. So, I mean, the, Pablo and I are just kind of astounded about all the listed buildings here and the potential they have. Yeah. And, you know, we just really want to listen to them and to feel like and, and also just feel like oh you know you've got so much value here you know we can do so much together and I think one of the reasons we wanted to set up Trafo our outdoor bar and kitchen was because you know at all our openings a lot of young people came and were like oh you know there's nothing to do here there's nowhere to go and have a drink or there's no young people and I guess we had we always have a huge kind of army of volunteers around and so they, they always want to come to the opening and meet all the volunteers, you know. So we felt like, oh, let's, pro let's provide something for them as well on site here and have their voices incorporated into the kind of fabric of Eberg. That's, yeah, <clears throat> beautiful. I, I always thought of sort of Eastern Germany's like Detroit when, you know, once the industry leaves. When this, yeah. Once it was 
very much political change, but it's very yeah, it's just absolute dissension. And what you said is thirty minutes outside of Berlin, yet it's two different worlds, which is it's totally different worlds. Yeah, insane to think about, and with so many issues surrounding Berlin now too, in terms of gentrification. I mean, it's not what it was ten years ago for living space. So sort of this idea of bringing something then to the surrounding which is so bare of so many things um yeah quite incredible also maybe well, i think it's been interesting sorry oh, I mean, no, Emily, no, no i just want to say you. if people have questions like feel free to jump in because we just <laughs> keep going otherwise i'll otherwise. ramble all day otherwise yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but sorry no no i absolutely uh, disrupted your, your train of thought Oh, don't worry. I think I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, in yeah, if if there's any questions, I think this is a this is a good moment um, as we're coming to an end. Um, also, once again, maybe think about having a closer look at the Kickstarter, which is on the Instagram profile of uh, Evag, or so um, on their website as well. Thank you. It's quite incredible. I think they've reached half their goal already. So I'm absolutely amazed and. <laughs> very, very cool things in return um as I yeah so, <laughs> yeah thank you we appreciate any support you know it's and it also it's kind of imperative to our survival as well to continue programming yeah. so really want to make this happen um so uh, if you can just donate one year we'll be super happy or even just spread the word yeah there's thank a you. beautiful trailer of the work and how it would sort of uh, by Lucia about the, the space that it would be in there too, which is also incredible to share. That alone gives you a really good impression because it was so hard to go to Venice and to see that work because it's, you know, this is a, a real shot of sort of re introducing it to a completely different public and space. So, um, yes, yeah. have a look. Um, and also um, just to let you know that, that, so because it's an all or nothing campaign, um, we won't be releasing tickets until after the campaign because we won't know if we can proceed with the performance yes. until we've raised the target. But hopefully tickets will be released um, from April the 12th or at that week. So okay. if you'd like to come and see it, we'd love you to come uh, and you can reserve a ticket then. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if there's no there will definitely be a free bar at the opening. Sorry, I've just seen a question there. <laughs> I think we that's have a what very... everybody missed the most during <laughs> No openings, so no free, free drinks, let's be honest. Well, I know. I mean, me too. But, uh, yes. you know, we're, we have a very kind sponsorship with Campari. So Campari <laughs> and the beach. It yeah, and it's, you know, we always squeeze them dry. So there's always enough for everybody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so donate so, that so will... I can have Campari. <laughs> now we have <laughs> And the, so just to remind everybody that the event will take place on the 5th and 6th of June, so Saturday, and then it will go to Berliner Festspiele afterwards yeah. from the 10th of June. So Either way, yeah. it was, was a little bit help at the end. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm looking very forward to it because I'm pretty certain that it's going to happen, I have to say. <laughs> so um, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Emily. Taking the time... Um, it was really nice. If you have any questions later, you can always chat with us. Um, I'm sure also uh, with the EVAC, if you have any questions, if you have direct, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm please do. We're an open door. So if you'd like to email us, um, please do. My email's on the uh, EVAC uh, website. So yeah. And if you'd like to volunteer also, we're looking for beach goers, singers, dogs, so if you're any of the above, please do get in touch. <laughs> Particularly dogs. Uh, particularly dogs. And we're looking for people sort of from April. So yeah. if you're interested, so do please do get in touch. So do they have to be local or can you also say, you know, you can come for a while and just do it for, um, yeah. So we really advocate that the in volunteers is international. However, due to the current restrictions, we're kind of pausing on that. We're just waiting to see what the next announcement from Germany will be. Um, and I know there are several um, travel restrictions, particularly from the UK um, and other places. So and it might be difficult, but no, if you're international, please do get in touch because we also invite volunteers to stay on site with us. Um, I have to say, I volunteered with the Venice edition. It was a really fun evening. 
So I did it oh, you great. Know, for a few hours and you just lay down and you read and you hear incredible music and you can, you know, play a game on the phone. But it was a really, really special thing to do. So I highly recommend it if there's a possibility to do it again. Also, there's really funny pictures of you afterwards. So <laughs> <laughs> worse than ever, every every account. So I highly yeah. recommend um, doing that. Um, well, have a lovely evening. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah, thank I'm, you, Emily. Congratulations on, on such an incredible institution. And I'm looking forward Thank you very to much. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye.